All right, everyone, we are here at Data Plus AI Summit. Uh, I'm super excited to be with Steve, CDO at Immuta. Steve, welcome to The Robert Show. We've been following Immuta's journey since a while. I was here last year, you remember, and uh, we had uh, some amazing conversations. First of all, uh, would love to know a little bit about what you do as the CTO at Immuta, and also what have you been hearing from enterprise leaders, customers here? Can you tell us a little more? Yeah, great, thanks for having me again. We've been for following sure. the Rabbit Show too. Thank you. You guys do great work. Um, so, CTAL, CTO to Muta, I do a lot of different things. Uh, very involved in our product management and product engineering side of the house, um, helping decide what features we should be building and how. Um, but then also, of course, involved with uh, our, our customers and customer success and working on some of our hardest problems with our customers. And a lot of them, to your point, are really having to change how they think about data. Exactly. Um, because of just the advancements of AI and how can they get more data in more people's hands and which causes more security problems, which I'm sure we'll talk about here, but um, so it's opened a whole new world of how customers can think about these kinds of things. For sure, I think AI kind of uh, changed the perspective, but also made it more innovative for uh, enterprise leaders and sometimes more challenges as well that Absolutely. they kind of you know uh, feel that, oh, now we feel more challenged about different things when it comes to data security, governance. Uh, I'm kind of curious to know what limitations make traditional request and approve workflows inadequate for today's data needs. What have you been hearing and how do you, how do you kind of see that? Yeah, so the first thing we kind of alluded to a second ago is there's more people than ever that can access and ask questions of data. Before, right. you know, I like to jokingly say it was, you know, mere mortals couldn't really ask questions of data because you either had to know how to write SQL or, or be a good expert user of a BI tool. Um, but now with AI, pretty much anyone can ask a question. So you can't just rely on people not knowing how to ask questions of data anymore as your yeah. security. Yeah. You've got to think about everyone in your organization as a, now a data consumer. So that obviously confuses things from a security perspective. Right. Um, so that's, that's the first piece. The second piece of your question is, I think a lot of organizations have really tried to reuse their existing request approved flows for data and it just doesn't work because they're built for applications. There's only so many permutations of access you have in an application. Yep. A lot of them are just you have access to the application or not or maybe there's three levels of roles you have in there where with data it could get sliced up hundreds or thousands of ways. Yep. You need to be able to manage the requests and approvals to that and our historical solutions for that don't scale. It's fantastic. Those are great insights, and thanks for sharing that, uh, Steve. I have one other interesting question around the architecture in you know the architect data. So, how do you architect data access systems that can handle the complexity of scale of modern enterprise and data consumption? Is there some specific uh, set rule pillars that you kind of follow? How do how do you kind of work around that? Yeah. So, I think part of the problem is there's a lot of uh, fragmentation in people's architectures. So there's the data platform, but then if you start thinking about how people discover what data might be useful to them, and then how do they then get access to that data, who yep. approves their access, we see a lot of cobbled together architectures that are a lot of square peg round hole type solutions, um, which again is kind of what I was alluding to earlier. I think you've got to think about not only the consumer interface of where they find the data, not only the data platform, but yep. the glue between those two things. How do they important. actually get access to what they need? So like the analogy we use sometimes is, it'd be kind of like going to amazon.com to try to shop, but then you can't actually get anything delivered to your house. <laughs> it doesn't do you much good. Yeah. So I think you've got to think about that, that layered consumer, approver, data layer and how everyone kind of weaves in between those Access. three layers. Yeah. Um, and, and architecting that from the start and not just thinking about the consumer interface alone and then figuring out the rest later. It just doesn't work. It's well. very important to understand that yeah. sort of uh, you know balance. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. Just on this uh, bit itself, I have another question which is around what new concepts and you know patterns are emerging to replace the friction of manual approval processes, what are you seeing there? Yeah, so AI does a lot, right? I mean, we, we can leverage that for a lot of great things. So 
a lot of our customers have to have a human in the loop for most of our approvals, yep. but we can help accelerate those humans. So we can do things like look at past trends in approvals and denials and make recommendations. This yep. is actually something we launched last week uh, ahead of this conference, which was what we call review assist. Yep. It'll look at historical trends and say, hey, this user looks pretty similar to people that have been approved, but not exactly the same. Why don't you temporarily approve them? And we can do temporary approvals nice. and then Immutable will revoke that access once that time expires. Um, so that helps accelerate. We're going to allow you to build rules where you can look at what the user looks like, what the data looks like, how they answer the questions, and automate some of those access decisions because while you do need a human in the loop, these rules can involve kind of human decision making. So true. So it's not necessarily them pressing a button, but it was their decisions that are just being acted upon as like a model or an agent to do it on their behalf. Um, so we believe that because there's going to be so many more consumers, you need to scale the people so true. And the, analyzing the approvals and doing that in a way that is still consistent with yeah. your corporate rules. And it's very personalized as well, where you can, yeah. you know, obviously making the approval on the recommendations that were made earlier by them. Yeah, exactly. And very specific, too, specific because too. the more coarse you get, the less meaningless, or the more meaningless so those, those recommendations would become. So being very precise about giving people access to only what they want access to is important for all that working well, which yeah. again, we, we aim to help. <laughs> just just wanting to know a little bit about how do you balance uh, the automated access with the governance and security requirements that approval uh, were designed to address? Anything around those lines? Yeah, so, I mean, we I think we kind of touched on that a second ago, but the just, there's going to be things that are high risk that are going to involve a human that they need to look at. And we, again, can help automate those risk levels and allow customers to kind of define what risk means to them. Because risk right. is going to be different for everyone. We can't just assume what's risky for one customer is the same as another. So, cool. so we let you, you know, turn those knobs, adjust what, what risk means for you, and then bubble the highest risk things to actual humans. And then, like I said a second ago, we can let you build automation around the things that are less risky or that you have known approval or auto denial type workflows to, to address it. That's fantastic. Steve, uh, these are great insights. So uh, one more quick question I have for you. If folks want to learn more about what you all are doing, how can they stay updated? But if they also want to follow you, which is the best place? Yeah, so I don't really post much on LinkedIn. <laughs> I mean, maybe Twitter would be the best. Okay. Um, a little bit on LinkedIn here and there. Um, as far as Amuta in general, www.amuta.com. Got a bunch of content there. I would actually encourage you to look at our docs. I nice. think our docs are really great. We've yep. got a bunch of content in there. We keep that up to date with all our new release information as well. I've got a bunch of blogs out there about our new features that would love people to read. But uh, yeah, or just reach out directly, um, stevenamuta.com. Yeah. So. Uh, Steve is approachable, you. you can reach out yeah. to Steve, <laughs> so that's fantastic, Steve. Uh, such a pleasure chatting with you, and thanks for all the great insights. Uh, we've learned a thing or two today, and uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Yeah. Uh, but Immuta is doing great in this space, so we'll keep following you. your journey. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you very much. Hopefully we can do it again next year. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs>